Hey, this is Jim McDonald. Welcome to episode 239 of the PowerCast. This episode is part one of our conversation with Stan Efferding. We talk about approaches that Stan used to come back from injury. He had a long-term hip injury that we've talked about before. He had a long-term problem with tendonitis in his knees and very recently a lower back thing. And he talks about what he did to get past those injuries and get back under the bar and be pain-free. So check out this episode. Friday's episode is actually an episode with Just Me and Mark, and part two with Stan is a separate discussion about business that will be next Wednesday. So check that out, and then next Friday's episode will not be an episode. There will be no episode next Friday, uh, the day after Thanksgiving, because there needs to be some kind of a break, right? And you guys are gonna have time to listen to it anyway. You're gonna be with your families, right? So anyway, like and share this episode, and we'll talk to you on Friday. Support for this episode of the PowerCast comes from Precision Nutrition, home of the world's top nutrition coaches. Head over to get.pn slash PowerCast for a free nutrition course, especially for PowerCast listeners, focusing on the role of carbs. That's G-E-T dot P-N slash PowerCast. Reebok.com, home of the legacy lifting shoe, the official shoe of the PowerCast at Reebok.com. Eight Man Strong Apparel, apparel for people who lift heavy weights at eightmanstrong.com. Compex Muscle Stem Products at compexusa.com. Use the code POWERCAST for an additional 28% off all but the lowest price model. Howmuchbench.net. Use the code POWERCAST for 15% off slingshots and free shipping on orders over a $100. And Bodybuilding.com, the world's largest fitness website and supplement store. Bodybuilding.com has free plans for every level. Visit at bodybuilding.com today to become your best self. Recorded live in West Sacramento, California, this is Mark Bell's PowerCast. Standing just to the left of Jim McDee, here's your host, Mark Bell. All right, All right. we're here today with the Rhino. Uh, Rhino uh, has come in to kick our ass in some training and to throw around some knowledge as always, but he just turned 50 years old. And when you turn 50 years old, what happens, Jim? Uh, ED. See. Yeah, and your balls shrink, and everything turns gray. Your balls shrink? Well, actually, what I thought they get bigger. What about those guys I saw at like the uh, the local uh, health clubs with the giant balls <laughs> in the locker room? That's different. Well, let's put it this way: somebody paints the ballroom gray. That's what happens. Yeah, some the fool, ballroom. Some fool paints the ballroom gray. Oh wow! It's sad. What was what color was it before? Um, not gray. <laughs> on a lighter note, red. though, I got to say one thing though is for the whole fiftieth that it was. It also happened to be, if I can say this without crying, my first parent-teacher conference with my five-year-old daughter. In oh my day goodness! Now. So that was a was big that day. before or after the prostate exam? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was the highlight of my day. Going in. And- gloating over my daughter with her kindergarten teacher. Oh, that's great. Sometimes those are uh, similar to a prostate exam. Yeah. If your kid is yeah. not yeah. You know, one of those. Yeah, it can be intrusive. Does Good your daughter like school? She loves it. Boy, that's cool. Tell you what, and they grow up fast. I took her to school when I would park and I'd walk her, you know, hold her hand and walk her and put her in line with the mm. teacher. That lasted about a week. <laughs> and then the second week, she's like, Daddy, you can just drop me off. I know how to get there. And I was like, Really? <laughs> so it's so embarrassed it's, yeah, it's by happening you. so fast. Well, because everyone's probably like, what the hell's up with your dad? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why, is he, why is he wearing an effing shit up shirt <laughs> yeah. in kindergarten? Is your dad a cartoon character? Yeah. Which cartoon is he on? Yeah. Why has he got all those muscles? I just have to stay jacked until she gets out of high school. Yeah. So I can you know, <clears throat> and intimidate, the, intimidate. The, those and, little high school kids and the rest of her life. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Probably. You have a son as well, right? I do. Three years old. Oh, my God. Yeah. He's three? Yeah. Get Holy big, cow. Quick. Happens fast. It does. Are, are your kids uh, more like you? Or are they more like the wife? Or they bounce back and uh, forth? They bounce person- back and forth. They're, they're whoever they need to be to get what they want at the time. <laughs> yeah. That's a good lesson that kids learn early. Yes, indeed. How do you balance and everything? You know, we, we saw you on um, we saw you on Shark Tank. Yeah. You're a world record uh, power lifter, a uh, pro bodybuilder. 
you're still staying in great shape at, at 50 years old. You're 250 and, I don't know, 8% body fat, set 5% body. I don't even know. Shredded, whatever the case is. You obviously put a lot of time and energy into yourself, which is his favorite person on the planet. We've come to learn. <laughs> How are you able to make time for yourself, make time for your kids, make time for the cooler? How are you able to balance it all? Well, it's, you know, it's priorities, first and foremost. And the training has become much less of a priority. Mm. I have become much less of a priority since having kids. You realize you're not the most important person in the world. Yeah. Has that, that been was, has that been a little hard, or has it been a, yeah. a, 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 a long transition? Well, I, I, I managed to transition. You know, yeah. some therapy <laughs> sessions. You know. <laughs> I'm not a big deal anymore. You know, you're tired. I would say every week for probably like two years or so, stand and be like, "Hey, remember this?" And even even just a week after it happened, it would be the 900 pound squat. He would, <laughs> he would text me. He'd be like, "Hey, remember this? Remember this?" And he did that with a lot of other stuff too, 600 pound bench and yeah. stuff like that. Well, you know, I've kind of made it part of my lifestyle and the kids' lifestyle, though the ex exercise as well. Because I have a little gym garage, and they'll come out and exercise. Oh, that's and, cool. That's awesome. Uh, same with my wife. The 10 minute walks. They'll come along mm. with me. They always uh, they want to go on the walk. Unfortunately, they make it about halfway and then want carried back. So. <laughs> becomes a little more than just a 10 minute walk. Let's talk about those 10 minute walks for a second here. Cause the 10 minute walk, you know, uh, again, like kind of looping it back into being able to make time for stuff or being able to even just execute stuff. The 10 minute walk is kind of low hanging fruit, right? Oh, it's huge. And the, the benefits that it provides and the sustainability of it, you know, with a busy schedule, how hard is it to drive to the gym and do a 40 minute treadmill session? If that's your regular plan yeah. for cardio, those are easy to, you know, to pass over because of yeah. busy schedules. And so uh, I just found it, plus the extra benefit uh, that it, we've seen scientifically that it provides with the increased insulin sensitivity, the uh, decreased bloating and gas, and, mm -hmm. you know, improvement in digestion as a result. Decreased gas. That's a good thing. Yeah, you don't could, bring that so, home. It stays so on the it, walk. It's a 10 minute fart walk. <laughs> it's is what we're much. About. That, yeah. yeah, it's, it's fueled. <laughs> Quinn Bell was right. That's what she told me. He was like, you're going to go on your 10-minute fart walk? And I was like, I never told her. I was like, I think that's what How happens. How did you know? <laughs> yeah. She must have been behind me. Well, the kid's tattletaling. It's so you can find your way home. You just <laughs> yeah. sniff your way home. Yeah, but that's a, one example of many ways that you can, uh, I think, become more efficient. Now that I'm older, I don't put yeah. pour as much time into my training. People are always surprised. You know, how many hours you spend in the gym a week? And they think it's every day or whatever. And I go to the gym for about an hour, twice a week, seriously, mm -hmm. you know, leg days. Right. And then maybe for 30 minutes on a third day, just doing some dips and chin-ups if I don't do them in my garage. Right. So that investment has, I've been able to get a bigger return on my investment by uh, training less, but but doing some like right. 20s and you know some more multi-joint And that's movement. something somebody told you like 30, 40 years ago, right? 30 yeah. years ago, you told me in the gym uh, you were killing yourself and overtraining. Less is and, more. And you had somebody, yeah, basically yeah. tell you that, and you gained weight, right, from that? Yeah, yeah. And as far as the, the dieting goes, that actually saves me time. Mm. Planning ahead, having things available, cooking three, four days of food at once, uh, you know, on a Sunday night. How does that save you time? Well, then I don't have to cook a meal. When I'm hungry, I don't have to go to the refrigerator and start from scratch. Mm, good point. It's prepared. It's in a Ziploc bag. I throw it in the microwave. Two minutes later, I'm eating, and then I'm on the road taking a 10-minute walk. But right. All of it, to me, is, is about economizing so I can spend you – know, I have more time to do the things I need to or want to do right. as opposed to, to being – I said many times when I was competing, you become a victim of your own circumstance. You're imprisoned by the obligations that are, you know, the, the, ne the necessities that allow you to compete at that level, which right. are, you know, so much more sleep, so much more training, so much more attention to diet and rehab, et cetera. And it becomes a full-time job. Right. And so now that I'm out of that, the, mo the, the best thing I think that has come of it is I finally started to realize how little you have to do consistently to maintain uh, a really reasonable level of health or fitness, depending on what you define that as. It's not uh, as you know, time consuming as a lot of people make it out to be. It just needs to be consistent. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. I think that um, what happens is that if you, if you get away from it and you dig yourself into a hole, getting out of the hole 
is very time consuming <laughs> and very, very uh, energy intensive, but maintaining is considerably easier. Yeah. And I think that people, I don't think people have a strategy for maintaining either, to tell you the truth. They, right. Uh, they think about the slog, and they they don't think that the day's ever going to come when they can back off, and it'll be okay. And, yeah. And I talked recently about you know if you want to be healthy, don't compete. Yeah. And the the gist of that was is that sometimes we push ourselves too hard, and that may actually be a detriment for those people who aren't competing, because then you end up with more delayed onset muscle soreness, mm-hmm. maybe in, potential injuries. Uh, obviously more obligation in terms of time and et cetera. And I'm trying to have more energy all the time. And having kids really makes you aware <laughs> of your energy deficit. Yeah. And I want more energy. I want to be able to spend more time, do more things with them. I don't want to be having be tired and sitting down. So if I'm doing these massive squat sessions or if I'm having to eat an enormous amount of food, obviously you're going to be more tired trying to recover from that. And, and just that amount of food makes you more tired. And so I try and eat a little less. I try and train without the same degree of intensity when I can, maybe just once a week with, with a significant intensity. And the rest of it is, is more of a hypertrophy or exercise focus, a volumizing cardio type of, of workout, the hit under load that I mm-hmm. like to do. And now I have more energy throughout the day. And I eat uh, with the intention of improving my energy. I don't have to pound down quite as much uh, white rice or pasta or whatever you have to do to fuel that kind of <coughs> workload or right. mass. And it gives you more energy that way. That's important to consider too, because you can't continue to eat the way that you ate that got you where you are. Yeah. Yeah. And maintain. And And you want to save your joints. You know, I had a lot of problems when I was competing and and when I finished competing, I had a lot of injuries and, uh, you know, the hips, the knees, the elbow, you know, uh, the back injuries over the years. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have to endure those anymore. And uh, so, you know, I went through a period at which I kind of had to redefine what my goals were. And I went into the gym with the specific intention of rehabbing my body, making it feel better, more usable, more functional per se. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't necessarily mean just flexible, but just pain-free movement. And uh, that has enabled me to continue to train and do some things. You know, more recently, I've been training a little heavier, you know, just for a brief period of time. I wouldn't have been able to been, been able to do that if I had those injuries. And I thought maybe we should get into some of that today because people yeah. keep asking me about what you do to rehab your chronic tendonitis in your knees? What do you do to rehab your hips? What do you do for chronic back injuries? And, you know, I've learned a lot o- over the, the, the years in rehabbing those. And my joints feel better than ever, better right. than they have in, in well over a decade. That's great. Yeah. Well, and sometimes they're messed up in the first place from the way that you're training. Uh, yeah. you, you mentioned just a moments ago. Uh, and you probably don't even really know the point of how little you could actually get away with to really maintain or to maintain your strength or to even improve your strength. Um, back when we were training and we were going after those powerlifting world records, uh, you'd come in, you'd squat. You know, it might take you, your warm up might take as long as the actual workout itself. Yeah. At yeah. some point, you know, especially we got down to those last six weeks, we chopped out a lot of stuff so that you weren't fatigued and so that your joints weren't, um, weren't getting beat up. But I, I have people ask quite a bit of questions about rehabbing and, uh, you know, obviously something has to be done once you get yourself into that position. Uh, but you know, winners win. If you can stay, if you can stay on top and you figure out a way to avoid some of that, uh, then you don't have to get yourself out of that position in the first place. And the way to do that is to make sure you're doing all the shit that you're supposed to be doing. Like the the warm up we did yesterday, we went on a ten minute walk yep. before we started our training session. We yep. did uh, well because we some ate activation. Right before we trained. So <laughs> yeah, we need so to walk those it Those two kind of got paired together, <laughs> but we did a little activation stuff before we started the workout. Yeah. It didn't take long. No, it does. Did some planks, side planks, regular yep. planks. Well, let's uh, let's jump into that because I get a lot of questions. First was uh, was about the knee rehab, and for over twelve years, I've had chronic tendonitis in my knees. And Which, the, by the way, is excruciating. Like you, yeah. would, it, somebody just says tendonitis, and if you never had it before, you're like, "Oh, okay, the guy's knee hurts." No, it, it's like somebody's yeah, sticking it's, a it's knife arthritic. in your knee. It is. Ugh. It is. 
And to the point where you couldn't stay in a car for very long because your knee was in a bent position mm. and it would just throb or in an uh, airplane. Uh, jump, jumper's yeah. knee, I think it's referred yep. to. You're constantly pushing on it and rubbing it and trying to get the, the pain out of it. And you have to move it or it's just such a, a sharp pain. It was, it was pretty bad, but it was tendonitis. It wasn't, uh, you know, a dynamic injury, uh, you know, an ACL mm-hmm. tear or anything like that, which is a completely different scenario. But in this case, uh, and it was from chronic use and it was from lifting very, very heavy for a lot of years. But I can remember back in 2006, not even be able to do a leg extension, which isn't a great example because that's kind of the worst exercise for sore knees, <laughs> yeah, the dislocating force. But, <laughs> and at the time, you know, this is another one of those examples of do as I say, not as I do. At the time, I was advising a, um, a rugby player, uh, Say, was his name, he's a Samoan guy. He's like 6'3", 310 pounds. Can you imagine walking out on a rugby field and that guy is standing opposite you? <laughs> Yeah, but he said he was guys. walking the other way. Yeah, he was saying that he loves to play rugby, but he can't train the way he used to train because his knees hurt. And so I encouraged him to get a pump in his knees before he trained, whether that was on a recumbent bike under resistance or whether he went to the leg press and did partial range of motion movements until he could get a pump in his knees. Mm-hmm. And ever since then, he has had much better luck and he's been very thankful for that and was able to train. Well, unfortunately, I would go back and forth from bodybuilding to powerlifting. And when I was bodybuilding, I would do a lot of volume higher reps, more constant tension, mm. and I would have less knee pain. And then when I go into powerlifting, of course, now you're doing singles, doubles, triples, a lot heavier weight, right. more severe knee pain. And it got to the point well, powerlifting where, too is always full range of motion. Yes. You know, that's the way we're taught to do it. We're taught to do it under the conditions of uh, the powerlifting meet, whereas bodybuilders, they're not as concerned. They might just go through a range of motion that feels good to create yeah. muscle tension, yeah. which could be less damaging on the joints potentially. So I've done everything over the years. I, I went to uh, you know, an HRT clinic back in Panama, and they took me over uh, to a hospital. We did um, you know, X-ray and, and uh, MRIs. And we tried to identify the problem, and it was pretty obvious. It's just tendonitis, mm-hmm. uh, be as it may. And so then you try and go through all of these therapies. And I've talked before about the fact that everybody wants to find something to take after the fact. Uh, in, or uh, you know, maybe it's a... Uh, glucosamine or chondroitin mm-hmm. or, you know, whatever thing of the day or popular thing of the day, or they want to have some sort of therapy done to them or for them, which I've said is never as effective as the things you do for yourself. Uh, they're uh, superficial and temporary. And that includes all the things like massage and um, ART or any that ART, stuff. electric stem, those kinds of things. They may have their place, but they're not a cure and they're certainly not the best solution. And then I, I followed through with all of the other popular, uh, you know, therapy attempts, the PRP injections, mm-hmm. the uh, prolotherapy injections, the stem cell injections, the um, TB500 and BPC157 and MGF injections directly into the knee, all of these, you know, directly into the knee. And you might realize some modicum of benefit over a short period of time, but not a significant amount and not a cure. Uh, and, and, you know, I have to say that during that process, of course, I was always trying to continue to train. Obviously, you'd take a, a temporary reprieve, but then you'd try and come back just as quickly as you could, uh, which aggravates the problem, obviously. So that brings me to just last year uh, where the chronic tendonitis was ongoing. And I had said in many of my videos that when I squat in the gym, I squat until my knees hurt so bad and I can't bend them and I leave. <laughs> mm. And I did that every week. And, Which uh, is not smart, by the way. No, no. <laughs> Initially, not after, a good sign of intelligence. <laughs> right. After not. finishing powerlifting, I, I started doing the high bar, close stance, deeper squat, lighter weight. Started with the bar, 135. I didn't post any of those videos, right? Mm. <laughs> I waited until I got up to a decent amount of weight. But, and, and with the more repetitions, the greater range of motion, the lighter weight, I realized some relief. I could go in and do a workout and not have to limp out of the gym. But there was still... You know, the tenderness, uh, you bump it into something, not being able to get down to the ground, you know, comfortably or sit on your knees. Uh, That always was existing. And then uh, about a year ago, uh, I was just kind of gotten so frustrated with the going to the gym, squatting and uh, just quitting when it felt like a hot knife was jabbed in your knee. And then you'd go wedge yourself into the car and could hardly get out when you got home because you couldn't bend it. That I decided to do... uh, what we call what Dr. Stuart McGill calls virtual surgery. Um, and we'll talk more about his book, uh, when uh, we talk about back injuries. Yeah. And really what that means is, is just, uh, pretend as though you were going to get surgery or just had surgery and then apply the recovery benefits, 
uh, from as you would if in fact that had happened. And for me specifically, after everything I'd tried and everything I'd been through, uh, that meant one, eliminate the source of the problem, which was the squat. And when I came down to train with you, I had chronic elbow tendonitis. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. eliminating the source of the problem meant we moved our hands out. We started using safety squat bar. Mm -hmm. We used the uh, slingshot at the time to help me minimize the, the pain right. so I could continue to train because we had a competition pending, so we couldn't completely stop. But we were able to eliminate a lot of the pain uh, from just making those minor adjustments, which uh, benefited me long term because then I was able to squat that way and not <clears throat> ever have elbow tendonitis again. Right. So I eliminated the source, uh, and then I had to find pain-free movements. This is the second part of, of Dr. Stuart McGill's recommendation. And at the time, I hadn't read his book. Yeah. What was interesting is this was some of the very same things I did for my hip recovery with, um, uh, with uh, Mark Philippi. Yeah. And I've talked about that previously, about I'm how we went about through. McGill's book with uh, Dr. Brian Stuart Carroll, McGill, right? Brian Carroll, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's two books. Dr. Stuart McGill writes, uh, wrote a book called The Back Mechanic which is a little more scientific, mm -hmm. uh, not uh, uh, terribly so, but it's, it's, it's... Do you read quite a bit? I do, yeah. I try and read all yeah. the time. I'm still learning a right. lot. And so, uh, and then Brian Carroll's book with Dr. Stuart McGill was The Gift of Injury. Right. And, uh, you know, it just turned out as I was, uh, and I'll get, I'll get to this after the knee conversation, but I, I Blaine Sumner had a uh, significant back injury some time ago and we had spoken and um, I just saw a recent post of his, uh, maybe a month or two ago, a couple months ago, where he'd posted the book, The Gift of Injury or Back Mechanic, mm. and mentioned it. And so I, I, I purchased it, found out, you know, we'll talk more about it. But if you're not following Blaine Sumner, by the way, you should be. The guy is amazing. Yeah, yeah he's incredible. Strength that that guy has yeah. and the way he's just in there training by himself. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. It's unbelievable. Squatting 1,100 pounds, single ply is a beast. Let me not get too distracted and go right back to the knees. Uh, what I found after all that time and energy invested into injections and electric stem and massage therapy, et cetera, et cetera, uh, when I eliminated the source of the problem, the squatting, and I found a pain-free movement, my pain-free movement was the banded leg press. Hmm. And I've talked a bit about this and showed some videos of my doing it. Once you find a pain-free movement, because as I've said, movement is the only way to cure your joint pain and your body in general. Yeah, blood sure. is the life force, it's the healing. But that movement has to be pain-free. Otherwise, uh, you know, you're just picking the scab over and over and over again. You're going to continue to, to degenerate the area and, and aggravate the problem and scar tissue, et cetera. Uh, and then what I did with the banded leg presses is I started doing them three times a week, uh, about every 48 to 72 hours. And I would do sets of 20s, and I would do it through a range of motion that didn't hurt. I wouldn't lock it out. I wouldn't go too deep. I, I basically say I take what my body gives me. And in this case, I found a pain-free movement, and then that movement gradually develops in terms of range of motion, uh, your ability to add more weight. <clears throat> and on the leg press, I brought my feet in and down, and that started to focus more of the attention towards the knees. I could get a good pump. Uh, I found a benefit uh, historically from doing the recumbent bike under tension. We talked about when I was training with you, how I put one in my hotel room. Yeah, And I would sit and ride that recumbent bike about three times a day. It would just be 10, 30-second sprints with 30-second rests under mm -hmm. modest tension to put a little baby pump in the legs. And I've spoken about the benefit of that concentric loading without creating muscle damage. There's no eccentric load in that, uh, mm -hmm. in that recumbent bike. Another reason why I like to run stairs, all concentric loading. So I'm not breaking down a lot of muscle tissues with the negative, you know, with the decelerating forces of, say, running or something. Uh, and that would put a lot of blood in my knees. And that was kind of how I maintained myself up to the point at which I decided it was time to fix the knees as opposed to just, um, you know, crutch them along and band-aid them. And so I was recovering pretty well with the recumbent bike training. And so I just expanded that into the pain-free movement that, uh, from the leg press. And within just a matter of months, it was, couldn't have been more than three months, my knees were completely healed. Wow. And this is, this is all things being equal. This is in the absence of any other uh, additional therapy efforts. This was doing the same thing I had done historically, except taking away the source of the pain, which was the squat, and then focusing on those pain-free movements, which was the leg press with the bands. And I'll, I'll say that it's probably a lot of bro science, but I think the, the biggest reason in terms of my tendonitis that the banded leg press has helped the most is because it didn't allow my tendon to relax and re-engage, creating that sort of guitar wire string sort of, yeah. you know, twanging, that sort of 
that's what aggravates those tendons is the relaxation and re-engagement. When they re-engage under load, uh, I think that's when they become inflamed. I think the stress is significantly more than if they're under constant tension. The change of direction. That's right. Yeah. And so I, I continued to do that. I got incredible pumps. Obviously, it was great for my VO2 max, for my cardiovascular conditioning to do sets of 20 or 25 reps with 90-second rest periods. And I really started to enjoy it a lot. Uh, but I, you know, I missed the squat rack. I, it's always kind of been my bread and butter. So you're doing right? that still on leg press. And so I was just leg pressing. And I, when I got my knees completely healthy, I mean, it was to the point, it was completely gone. I had no more bruising sensation. Then I started going back into squatting. And I worked up, and you saw some videos not too long mm -hmm. ago. I worked all the way up to where I was squatting 600 for six reps, walked out with uh, uh, no knee wraps and no knee sleeves with no pain. Nothing, wow. nothing at all. So what do the banded leg presses look like for people who haven't seen them? You know, I, I just get a set of bands and the set I have is the rogue band, the gray band, the heavy band. You, you, there's a, a, a downsize set that's, I think they're red from mm -hmm. rogue. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, it's a, what's the weight on? Uh, it just depends on the stretch. Yeah. You can't really mm -hmm. predict it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just do it by feel. And I, what I'll do is where the handles are on the leg press, I'll just uh, hook it there and I'll hook it onto the post. Gotcha where you put your weights. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the first set, you might do 20 reps and feel like you could have done 40. You have one band on there or two? Two, one on each side. Gotcha. Every machine's different as to where you can strap mm -hmm. them. And then if you could loop them through themselves, you can increase tension. <clears throat> no plates, though. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll throw a plate on or two or three, depending on how I feel. You know, I started, of course, with just the bands. Just the bands. Over time, there was a progression. I was able to do more reps, more sets, more weight. Uh, and my knees... You, you always seem to push better. everything really hard. As you started to feel better, did you start to have four plates on there, five plates on there, stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, we worked up. We worked up heavier yeah. bands, uh, looped through for a harder stretch, uh, just to you know increase the weight. Because someone else's progression might look different, but do you think that's still valuable to add, yeah, add a little I, bit? Yeah, there's you know, something to it, right? For the rehab component, the blood was the most important. Right. But for me in training, I still want to get some, if you're going to work out, you should get some hypertrophy benefit or some strength benefit. I mean, there's a, mm -hmm. there's a reason, right, to work out is to, to, I think, to get some sort of gain. What's really interesting about what you're saying is um, you mentioned baby pump, which you should trademark, by the way. That's <laughs> fantastic. Um, some of the stuff you're talking about, you're talking about kind of scratching your own itch, you know. Um someone else can't really solve your problems for you. You have to figure out how to solve them yourself. And there's definitely, there's definitely uh, some magic in that. Um, I heard yesterday uh, somebody was talking about walking and we, just, we were talking about the 10 minute walk and we were like, go outside. Like there's something different about being connected to the earth, Yeah, you know? And, and yeah, walking on a treadmill, of course it could be valuable. You can burn sure. calories. It's got yeah. plenty of value too. But if you have the option to walk on the street, maybe it's a little bit better. Um, and in addition to that, what you're saying is, you mentioned the concentric only work, uh, which that is really fascinating to me because a lot of the research has been in the eccentric yeah. uh, in terms of rehabilitation. Strength, <laughs> muscle tissue breakdown, yeah. microfiber tearing. Right. Yeah, the and they'll tell you a lot of times, um, especially current trends in strength training, uh, they'll tell you that um, – you know, you want to do a slow eccentric. So somebody like might go to you and say, oh, your knees hurt. Let's have you do a five or six sec second eccentric, which you kind of did anyway. <laughs> yes. um, and, and also come up uh, under control. So that way you're not exploding and that change of direction isn't really drastic. But what you're talking about is is quite different. It's really just uh, almost a way of mimicking uh, like a complex unit or something like that uh, where you're going to flush a lot of blood in there but it's, it's mainly through concentric training. And when you're taking the band into effect, if you think about it, uh, logically, there's less band tension on the way down, which is the eccentric portion, mm -hmm. and there's more band, te band tension on the way up, right. which is the concentric yeah. it's portion. It's lighter where you're weaker, stronger, and it's heavier where you're stronger. That makes and, sense. And right. Also where your joint is the most exposed <laughs> at the bottom, and when it's at, at full yeah. bend, is when it's the lightest. So all of that contributes. It's much similar to what the, the philosophy behind the slingshot and why that worked so well. Right. It really makes a lot of sense. Joel Jameson was just on with us. And, God uh, damn, he was good. He was really, really good. But he was talking about um, recovery workouts, like 30, 40 minute recovery workouts on off days that are primarily concentric, like minimizing eccentric. Yeah, prowler pushes. Yeah. Some stair sprints. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting way to, uh, to be able to do it. But then you were able to 
take that and you still haven't had any knee pain since? None since. And, uh, you know, I mentioned that when I was doing the bands, the first set of 20, you might be able to do 40. Right. But this, each subsequent set with the 90 second rest uh, got harder and harder and harder. So by the time you got to the fifth, sixth, or seventh set, if you, if you eventually got decided to do that many, those sets would be near failure, pretty, pretty close. Mm-hmm. It would be a hell of a workout. Now, a lot of that, of course, is oxygen debt, lactic acid buildup, et cetera, and not necessarily muscle failure at that point. But it was still very effective. I was able to maintain strength and, and size through the rehab. Right. Uh, and my knees have never felt better. I just, I'm waiting for like some little twinge or something. It just doesn't happen. All yeah. the things I was historically used to doesn't happen. And I no, wasn't at some point to- you might have to go back to that because right, like that's that's the way things work. Uh, well, the movement and of your course, knee I might get deconditioned a little bit. It may, and and that's why you know it, I always say the movement. And of course, I was doing the 10 minute walks all throughout this process as well. Mm-hmm. Right, and those were a little less specific, a little less bend, but again, more and more and more and more blood flow. Again, more and more what you do for yourself being more effective than all these other methods that we tend to rush out and try and pay money for cryotherapy, right. you know, mm-hmm. massage, electric stem, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, those have been largely ineffective. I, I think overall the research suggests that there's, it's more of a uh, uh, placebo effect. Mm-hmm. They, they can't really see a significant benefit over time. If you think it works, it works, mm-hmm. right? The placebo effect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's all good if it feels good, but uh, it shouldn't be the priority. It should definitely be your own movement. It was interesting that you said too that you were not focused on full range of motion, especially at the beginning. And and if you think about it, if you're rehabbing something after surgery like a knee, you don't have full range of motion no. at the beginning. You have to work with the range of motion that it'll allow, and you work toward a full range of motion. Yeah. So that that it, remarkably intuitive. And you want to pump as much blood in there as possible. That's where yeah. all the oxygens, all the nutrients right. are, and the movement. Then again, also helps clean all the toxins and. and waste out because right. your lymphatic system doesn't have a pump to do that for you. You need to move to do that for yourself and gradually develop uh, more endurance, more range of motion from those pain-free movements, which is some of that, uh, it was, you discovered on your own, right? And, and, uh, that wasn't, uh, from Stuart McGill's books or, or no, I'm or, saying this is a long history of having, you, you tend to come across things that, that work right. or you're, you know, I was obviously exposed to that with, uh, with, training with you and right. again with um, Mark Philippi. So you learn over the years and then when you see someone uh, have such the amount of success and right. such that is as experienced as Dr. McGill, McGill and working with such a uh, difficult uh, thing as the back, the lower back, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, knees and elbows are pretty inconsequential in comparison. Yeah. Shoulders obviously more complicated, but back ultimately one of the worst. And I've got a, <clears throat> a, a recent back rehab story to share as well. We can get right. deeper into Dr. McGill's stuff, but I wanted to start with that, that knee rehab that seems to be the biggest question I've gotten over the last year and right. never bothered to. And that's something that it. you, that you kind of stumbled upon yourself by rubbing elbows with all these different people. You yeah. just thought to yourself, Hey, if I do some high reps on a movement that's pain free, maybe I'd be able to get some momentum and get some results from it. It also has to do mentally with creating that as your priority. Right. If, if rehab is secondary to training, right. it, you'll never rehab. Right. And so you have, and that was one of the big things with Brian Carroll that he, you have to be all in and that has to right. be the first and foremost. And then right. you have to put the training, the squatting. That seems to be the hardest the part is to try that to detach yourself from the weight. Like we, yep. we squatted yesterday <clears throat> and I embarrassingly, embarrassingly uh, squatted 225 for some reps. I went up to 405, just didn't feel right. And I got some sort of weird groin thing going on. I'm like, you know what? I could try to go heavier, but there's really no point. I'm just going to be in tons of pain. I'll be mm-hmm. in pain the next couple of days. And it's hard to detach yourself from that because yeah. you're, you're, yeah. you're, you're so attached. That's what we do. We lift heavy mm-hmm. weights. And you're never cured. And, and that gets us into our kind of segues into our back issue. Just a word from our sponsor, uh, Precision Nutrition. In the past few years, I bet you've heard all or thought at least one of the following. This is for uh, questions for our audience. Carbs spike your blood sugar and insulin, which prevents fat loss and causes fat gain. Carbs, especially sugar and grains, cause inflammation, and carbs are not an essential part of a healthy diet like fat and protein are. Have you heard those things? Have you thought yeah, those you know, things? It's, it's a real guessing game out there. You know, you, you don't know... 
you don't know what's true all the time. And I yeah. think a lot of us could use some help. And, you know, even in talking to you about your diet, we're on vastly different diets. Yeah. You know, our diets are quite a bit different. Uh, I'm not someone that really tracks stuff and really pays attention to the exact macronutrient breakdown. Meanwhile, you're following something that's totally different. Yeah. And I'm trying to do that. Yeah. And you've lost some weight. Yep. And I'm following something totally different from you. And I've lost some weight. And it's really just a matter of finding something that's going to work for you. And I think you just hear that over and over again. It sounds very cliche, but I think it's very true. If you can find something and you can start to break some bad habits, then you can really start to get back on the right track. And something like precision nutrition is going to help lead you down the right path. Yep. Um, all of this seems obviously very simple if you just make it all black and white. Right. And and what you're pointing out is the fact that it's really not black and white. Simplistic ideas about good food and bad food ignore biological complexity and the bigger picture of, of, of the whole diet uh, whole diet scene. That's why our sponsor, Precision Nutrition, created a brand new free course for PowerCast li- listeners to dig into the science behind low-carb and ketogenic diets. Visit get.pn slash PowerCast and get to get access to the free course, which covers what the research tells us about low-carb and ketogenic diets, how to know if low-carb, keto, or something else is right for you or your clients, the difference between paleo-style diets and low-carb diets, which ways of eating are the most effective for health and and body change, a step-by-step guide to finding the right way of eating for you or your clients, and much more. Not only will the course give you a deeper understanding of these topics for yourself, but when friends, family, clients, and colleagues come to you for advice, rest assured that you'll have the science-based, client-tested answers that they need. People ask us questions all the time, yeah. and you know, you, we know what we know, but do we always know the science about it behind it? And do we always can we always answer those questions in a way that's tailored to that person's particular needs? Principle of awareness. It's a key component to to anything to gain to gain further knowledge and to know why you're doing something is extremely important. The other thing is, um, have you been stuck losing weight? Yeah. Yeah. So have I. Yeah. And I'm like, I have a very conscious effort towards losing weight i'm exercising more uh you figure out ways to eat less or to uh work your way out of some some bad habits and things like that and the only thing that's been successful for people that i've worked with personally have been people that continue to interact with me and Mm -hmm. those are the people because you really do need somebody you think you can do it on your own but it's very difficult you kind of need someone to to lead you to it. And so I think with precision nutrition, that's exactly what you're going to get. You're going to get a group of people that care and a group of people that are going to lead you to the right thing. Trust me when I say this is some of PN's best work over the last decade. They've helped nearly 100,000 clients get their own eating on track and nearly 50,000 professionals stay on the cutting edge of the industry. Consultants to companies like Apple, Equinox, UFC, and Titleist athletes like the newest U.S. Open champion Sloan Stevens, they're doing amazing work and you need to check it out. So if you want to understand the science behind the low-carb diet trend and the best way of eating for you or a client, grab the free course at get.pn slash powercast. That's G-E-T dot pn slash power cast check it out guys check it out so here i am squatting 600 for six reps with no knee wraps walked out and uh because we started when my knees got better they felt great the squat started to feel good and my training partners and i said you know we've been doing these 20s for two years (laughs) let's do a little strength block right and i'm all for it because i feel healthy i'm great so we did a little strength block we started adding a little weight every week 500 became 550, became 600, became 650. Deadlifts, same thing, 600, 650, 700. I posted some videos, I doubled to 725, I squatted yeah. 700, you know, it's all great. <laughs> when, once I saw the 725, I was like, I was like, oh man, I was like, he's going to get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happens. Yeah. And for a lot of reasons, and I'll talk through those so people can, can kind of meter themselves, uh, you know, do as I say, not as I do. And the biggest reason is is, is that um, I started to have a few twinges here and there, a little uh, little lower back twinge. It was more SI joint, uh, mm. numb toe, uh, mm. you know. And you figure, ah, you wake up the next morning, oh, I'm okay. You know, by that afternoon, you're like, ah, I feel pretty good. And so by the next week, you you deadlift again or you squat again. 
and then, you know, oh, that's a little sore. Those kinds of things need to be paid attention to then. I didn't pay attention to them. Plus, our six-week strength block turned into eight weeks, turned into 10 <laughs> weeks with no deloading, yeah. uh, which is hugely important. Brian Carroll talks about this in his rehab, uh, that he would only do three weeks of heavy lifting at a time before he would do a 50% week for deloading. Eddie Cohn did that in the middle of his uh, pyramid going into meats. Right. And you've he helped do- so many people with uh, dieting, too. Um, when somebody's like, if somebody's dieting real hard and, and you see a picture of them or you see, uh, or they, they come to you and they pose or something like that and they're depleted, yeah. you're going to be like, oh shit, we got to, you know, we got to quote unquote deload. Like we got to yeah. ramp your calories back up. We got to reintroduce carbs. You kind of just look like you're dying rather yeah. than dieting, right? You got to fire up the furnace because <laughs> you're, you're shutting down. Right. And, and same thing happens with your training. With training, you build up too much fatigue. Uh, and that doesn't really have, it, it's not really only a concern with respect to your strength. It's a concern with respect to your, your injury potential. And, uh, Eddie Cohn would do the same thing. He would do four weeks heavy and then he would drop down for a deload. And then he would, he would start back over at 85% of the weight that he finished after, after four weeks and, uh, ramp back up again for four more weeks to take a deload before his meet. It was pretty common. Brian Carroll does a three week deal and he does a deload and then does another three weeks like that. And, uh, you know, pays attention the entire time to those, those little uh, hints and clues. Mm-hmm. Well, and then the real magic of what Ed did is he did a lot of assistance exercises. Yeah. He spent yeah. a lot of time in the gym. So he was getting a bang for his buck with the main movement, but then he was also doing leg extensions, leg curls. Yeah. And we look Particularly at something Particularly after like, competition, hypertrophy yeah. phases. Yeah. We look at uh, leg extensions and leg curls and people are like, oh, you should be doing a glute ham raise or you should be pushing the sled. Mm. It's not functional or whatever, but it obviously worked really well for him. And just the concentration on building those muscles, getting some blood blood to the area is is huge yeah huge aspect of huge so i didn't listen to myself and sure enough i got (laughs) under a big squat started trying to do 600 for reps again and boom i felt the the lumbar bow out and that was uh that was a herniated disc and that's the end of your day (laughs) and if anybody who's ever had a herniated disc know what the next morning feels like Mm. that was that was a nightmare you wake up in the morning and you're essentially paralyzed because if you try and twist or turn one way or the other, it's like somebody's literally sticking yeah. a hot knife in your back and just grinding with it. And you can't move. You're paralyzed there. It, you're it's like that pain. Kill Bill uh, scene where she's trying yep. to move her toe. <laughs> yeah. So you end yeah. up trying to slide out of bed and on your knees and, you're, and you can't inhale fully because the, the nerves and the lungs start to exhale. You see you're doing one of these numbers. <laughs> And, uh, you know, eventually you got to try and get up to your feet and uh, uh, using your triceps as much as possible. Yes, push pushing yourself. off of the bed and the mm-hmm. dresser. And that's what it looked like, you know, and then limping around for for a long time just to try and get a little bit of blood in there. So it was pretty extreme. It was a herniated disc. And, uh, uh, you know, that kind of put an end to my heavy squatting and lesson learned. But now the rehab had to begin. And, uh, you know, initially, obviously, you take some time off and it, it uh, you know, at least some of the severe pain will start to subside a little bit. Dr. McGill talks in his book about the fact that at night when you sleep, that your um, discs are, I think he called it hydrophilic, they, uh, they absorb a lot of water mm-hmm. and uh, expand. And so when you wake up in the morning, uh, those discs are all full. And, that's why you're uh, taller in the morning. Yes, yeah, why you're taller in the morning. And that's also why they push against the nerves. Your back's tight. Your mm-hmm. back's tight and you have the pain from all those nerves being stimulated. And then by the time you get up and walk around for a while and take a hot shower, et cetera, you start to feel okay, which is... Uh, i say the best thing you do in the morning is walk. Get yeah. Your, get your body temperature up mm. a little bit. Yeah. Get up and take a walk. And so it, it's tolerable. Uh, the problem is it gives you this false sense of security that a week later when mid-afternoon, it's like, oh, it's not too bad that you can go squat again. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that's obviously part of the problem. Is it's to, amazing the difference a couple of days makes, huh? Oh, it's Because one day you can't walk. Mm. You know, everything's a problem. Yeah. Picking a bag up off the ground or anything's a problem. Yeah. And then a couple of days later, you're walking and moving around. And you're like, oh, I feel yeah. good enough to go in there and yeah. kick some ass. And today. the mentality when you can't walk is that come to Jesus moment. Oh, God, please, I'll never do it again. <laughs> and then two days later, when it's feeling okay, you're like, hey, you forget uh, that. He's, I never do he's right here. Well, <laughs> I was just kidding. You know, <laughs> how about just one more time? You know, or maybe only 80% load. But yeah. uh, Brian Carroll talks about that, about how he for so long kept pushing the envelope, uh, training through pain, with pain, competing with pain, through pain, uh, which was pretty remarkable considering what he ultimately ended up uh, being diagnosed with when he went to Dr. McGill's and, and they did the x-rays. 
and he had uh, actually a broken sacrum. <laughs> the bone was split and wedging and growing. Uh, it, was, it was broken. He had a crushed vertebrae. He had uh, two, I think, uh, herniated discs. It was, it was a hot mess. And, Jeez. The, and it brought him to a point when he talks very candidly in, in the book, uh, this is the gift of injury, and it's with both Dr. Stuart McGill and Brian Carroll that talks through all the, the process of, of how to recover both mentally and physically, and got him back to competition where he was able to set records again. Uh, but he, he talked about emotionally the impact that that has. And I think we all it makes know. you fucking sad. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it does. It makes you know. It makes you like. And we know that. Moralizing. Fuck your yeah. elbow, but at the same time, mentally, you're yeah. like, you know, it's a big deal. You know, your knees, your hips, or whatever. When you're, it's a huge deal. Especially when it's you've competed at such a high level, and, and mm. you know, having to let that go. <laughs> But then just wanting to be healthy again uh, becomes, you know, very emotional. Yeah. For you. Well, how cool is it when someone's doing uh, something in the gym and uh, you're able to walk up to it and do it for like a set of five or yeah. pick it up with one with one hand like yeah. you did that one day with a 500 pound deadlift. I mean, those kind of things are fun. Yeah. And and you feel you kind of earned it a little bit because you've been training for so long and you're like, oh, this would be great. Like, yep. you know, uh, yeah, you're showing someone up a little bit, but you're, you're it's all in good fun. But when you can't do that anymore, yeah. you know, you can't, you can't even do half of that. You're just or like, you can't pick up your kids. Yeah. No, you're just and, like, and you know what? That is a huge deal. That's really demoralizing. Yeah, yeah. it really is. And that you say to yourself, I want to play tennis down. with you're my like, kids eh. one day. You know, and I want to be able to toss them around. And when your back's like that or your shoulder or what have you, it, it, uh, it's, it's a lot emotionally. But what do you do about it? And I've said so many times, uh, are, you, are you doing it? What are you doing about it? You have to decide that that's a priority and you have to attack that with the same amount of vigor as you would have you know, a bodybuilding show or a powerlifting meet. I'm going to rehab first. That's my current goal. That's my competition. You know? And that's what Brian did. Ultimately, he decided and agreed upon when he went to Canada and, and was diagnosed that, that they would focus on getting healthy first and not talk about when or whether he would compete again or lift those weights that that was not to be uh you know injected into the therapy and the same uh principles apply here and these are from dr mcgill to uh, brian and again this isn't all the information this is just some of it and i would highly encourage anybody to get the book i did immediately we got both books uh, back mechanic and gift of injury and i don't know brian and i've never met him and i don't know dr mcgill i've never met him so uh, you know, I'm not uh, promoting, you know, anything for, for their ne necessary, their best But interest. click Just, the link below so you can get 15% yes, off. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but it, it certainly, you know, was, was one of the most, uh, I think, instructional, comprehensive, uh, uh, you know, books that I've read that allows, just walks you through step by step through the whole process, physically, emotionally, the whole, whole nine yards, every aspect of what you may experience. And uh, again, the overlying factors being eliminating the source. So, that became first. Then find pain-free movements. We're talking specifically about the back now. Uh, it's one of the diff most difficult things. You know, with the knee, I said, I, you know, your recumbent bike or your leg press, you could mm. find a way that you could move without pain. And that affords your back the opportunity to start to repair itself. If you're constantly, Dr. McGill calls it picking the scab. If you're constantly <coughs> bending inappropriately. Um, and I think Brian Carroll wrote something a long time ago before his book that I may have read. Uh, about the fact that, that he had to be very aware of any, all, at all times, getting in and out of the car, bending and twisting to pick up a bag of groceries, anything like that could have a significant effect and set him back in terms of his repair. So you have to uh, be able to find pain-free movements just in walking, standing, sleeping, and then exercising. And that's what he did. And um, Dr. McGill went on to talk about, so what are those movements? What are the, you know, his suggestion is to the, the best movements that tend to work for most people and the ones to avoid. And the ones that were best that, that work for most people are the, the core stabilization movements. Uh, because as I've said before, the core is not a flexor. Your abdominals and your lower back are stabilizers and all the muscles there are really intended to prevent movement, not to uh, create movement. So all the sit-ups and the hyperextensions, that's actually debilitating. That's actually um, repetitive strain that, that can can break down the lower back. And so he focuses on core movements. Uh, and initially, uh, he looks at stuff that's, that's uh, um, endurance before strength. 
uh, with core movements. And so it may be some, uh, like we did, we did some, some planks. Right. Uh, 15 seconds each, not hard. Yeah. And then on the side planks yeah. uh, on each side. Um, he has another movement that he, he calls a, it's a crunch, uh, like a, um, a modified curl up, but you don't actually curl. You just uh, barely lift up off the ground. And there's, uh, there's actually videos of him doing these online, mm-hmm. Brian Carroll and Stuart McGill, Dr. Stuart McGill. And they're very well described in the book as well. But those exercises, along with one I, I think he calls the, um, the bird dog that we did yesterday, yep. uh, where you raise your uh, left leg and your right hand in a, in a dog position on all fours. Um, another way to stabilize the core and get your core working to, to right. balance all the muscles. A lot of stuff we've seen Brian Shaw do at this gym. You know, he, yes. at Super Training, he's come and he does all these movements, you know, before he lifts. And you're like... This is really admirable of a world's strongest man competitor. Yeah. You know, because in. you're not thinking like, it's almost like he, if he came in and like did ballet before his <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> training session, it's kind of unexpected. You yeah. would think like, oh, this guy's going to throw on some hardcore music and he's going to get all bloody and fired up and he's going to yeah. punch a hole in the wall and he's going to lift a million pounds. It's like yep. he's rolling out a yoga mat. <laughs> and he, yeah, he's yeah. over there doing his, his prep <laughs> movements. And we did those, to, I do those before working out to stabilize the core, but they had to be done, you know, at least initially every day. Right. And maybe twice a day if you can. They're they're not they don't take terribly too much time. No, it wasn't hard. No, they don't build up a lot of fatigue. Uh, it's really just about starting to slowly, uh, you know, reestablish pain free. The thing I like core. about stuff like that too is um, it gives you a, a chance to run a diagnostic on yourself of where you're at. Yeah. So if you go to do a few warm up movements and you're like, oh my god, my hip is killing me today or my hamstring well then maybe you can take the extra time to be cautious towards whatever's in pain or uh, you're saying pain-free movement maybe that's maybe that's not your day or maybe you have to find something different that day because who knows how you tweak something but it happens right and during these warm-ups is a great opportunity to kind of check and see how the body's doing maybe you have to change your workout for the day we call that instinctive training you go to the gym and if it hurts don't do it yeah you know it always says you know it's will ask me, oh, I did this exercise and it hurt. My answer is don't do that exercise. Yeah. What, what level of pain do you think is acceptable? Because um, obviously, you know, to build up the body that you built up and, and to break multiple world records in the squat and in the total, there's got to be some pain associated yeah, yeah, with some. You kind of have to differentiate between good hurt and bad hurt, between pain and injury. Right. And uh, the, the, there should be some alarm bells yeah, going off. Yeah, Certain yeah. things you just know, but you're stubborn mm-hmm. or you're a tough guy. And you know, we all know what that's about. <laughs> right. Working through injury or what have you. Working through pain, probably not a bad idea, but working through injury is a terrible idea. Yeah, I know James, uh, James Smith, um, and, and I don't know, I can't recall whether this protocol was, uh, was only for if you're rehabbing, but I think it's a good general rule, too. He's like, you know, in general, things shouldn't really hurt that much. And he's like, if on a scale of 1 to 10, if you just use a level of 3, uh, to to understand that you shouldn't be above a level of three in terms of pain. Now, pain is one thing and exhaustion is another. So when you're doing an exercise and you're doing a set of 20 and your legs are burning. Um, That's it, a good hurt. It, 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 yeah. feels, yeah, good it hurt. feels like pain. Yeah. It feels like pain, but it's not. Um, if you do an extra rep or yeah. something, you're not compromising anything. Um, Muscles and joints are two different things in terms of pain. Yeah, and the pain yeah. that you would be worried about on a set of 20 with squats uh, would be like your lower back because now things are starting to fall apart. You're starting to round over, start to use your lower back, and that's when you have to be cautious and probably rack the weight. Yeah. yeah. So we talked about things to do, uh, and the biggest things are using the core as a stabilizer, find pain-free movements, do the core stabilization movements, which is the bird dog and the, the side planks, et cetera. The weighted carries, uh, you know, eventually starting light first, again, endurance before strength, uh, have always been great for the lower back. Uh, and maybe it's like the one dumbbell arm mm-hmm. carry too. For, yeah, you those know, are tough. Side. Those are great. Those are really hard. And eventually, you, you know, you can graduate from that and get back into your core movement with, uh, you know, a very specific attention paid to uh, – you know, not getting your lower back out of position, you know, with, being very careful. With your bodybuilding background, have you um, thought of just like going in and doing some bodybuilding stuff? Because yeah, that's what I do. You yeah, know, because that's what I did uh, through the rehab since, since lat, I herniated my disc, I, I yeah. went through all these exercises: lat pull downs, tricep push downs. Um, yep, curls fine movements that don't hurt. 
There's a yeah. lot of movement right there that don't hurt. And I, yeah. I've noticed uh, with curling movements in particular, it feels like your core's engaged yeah. pretty good. Absolutely, when doing, yeah. When you're doing bicep work, yep. you're also getting some grip. I mean, you just have to be careful how far away from the body you let that weight get. Yeah. Because it creates a significant amount of strain on the lower back as it gets away from your body. So keep right. things close to your core. That's right. Really like the weighted carries here. And I think a, a thing that is important about this is that <clears throat> if you take it on as a project, your recovery. Yeah. You don't have to think about, I'm going to be limited the whole rest of my life by a back injury. Right. I'm going to have to keep it in mind. Yeah. I'm going to have to take care of it, but I'm not going to be, you know, in a bed on Oxycontins the rest right. of my life just because I had a back injury. Right. If you look at uh, Matt Wenning, I think he's got great perspective on it where he likes to do, um, almost like a little bit of a bodybuilding slash powerlifting, uh, warm up. So if he's going to, bench for the day uh he may do um some curls he may do some tricep push downs he may do some um incline dumbbell bench press and he might mm -hmm. fire through four or five sets of that to help build up conditioning a little bit like you're talking about with uh the leg press for the for the legs he would get some of that in before he started his training session um maybe in a, a little bit of mobility work and then boom he'd go right into his uh right into his workout so yeah. there's a lot of different ways of, of breaking this up and uh with that scenario it might even be smarter to um shit, we had somebody on the podcast recently that was uh integrating some mobility work into that circuit which i thought was right. really a really smart move because now now you're doing some of the things that you enjoy and you're mixing with some of the things you really don't like yeah. you know so those planks and some of those other movements i mean i don't see any reason why you couldn't uh superset that with a lateral raise or something you yeah. could throw in some bro bro lifts in there nothing if you wrong with to. it and brian did a lot of that he did a lot of uh uh, some of those quote unquote bodybuilding type Make movements and the boring. mobility work. And we talk about mobility. Uh, we're talking about things like a goblet squat or things mm -hmm. like, uh, Oh yeah, know, we did swing some your, of the, swing you your know, hips and, and et cetera. Go why do we forget about the, why do we forget about this stuff? What the happens? Easiest stuff. <laughs> well, you have to plan for it. He created a workout that that's yeah. what it was about. He would right. go in and do his, his basics. And again, you know, when I went back to being able goblet to squat, it's great. I did them with him yesterday. I'm yeah. like, why did I, how I forgot about what, these? Yeah, Mark Phillippe did with me recently and, too. They're fucking great. Injury, and it completely healed my hip by getting into those kind of what we call mobility movements as opposed to stretching. Right. And that's another thing that Dr. McGill talked about that you have to be very cautious of or not do at all. Yoga or static stretching for the lower back, it's not intended to be stretched like that. And you yeah. will continue to pick the scab if you continue to stretch your lower back. It's not intended for that. It makes it uh, overly pliable and not stable. It's, yeah. it's kind of like the difference between mm -hmm. a, a marathon runner and a sprinter is the difference between uh, yoga and a power lifter in terms <laughs> of performance. It's just two completely different disciplines, yeah. and it will affect, you know, a great power lifter uh, will probably sacrifice some flexibility. Right. I'm not saying mobility. It's two totally different things. You know, static stretching, especially to the degree that, that you would experience in, in say, a yoga uh, environment, and mobility work are two completely different things. And so when I was working with Philippi and, and a lot of the stuff that Brian Carroll did in his rehab included, like those goblet squat type movements, he would just have to make sure not to put his, not to fall out of those pain-free movements. Mm -hmm. Right. And that was hugely important for him. And he would create uh, a progression, you know, maybe 50% loads initially. Like, like I had to do, I had to go back to lighter weight with my belt, a little higher reps before I could, first it was just leg presses and then I could get under the, the back squat. And then I had to actually go to a sumo pole mm. Because the uh, conventional pole would, a too much. would immediately hit my lower my no, lumbar spine. No, that's when uh, using some intuition is is smart. You know, um, yeah. something you can practice uh, might seem kind of weird, but if you write something out or say something out loud, a lot of times you realize how fucking dumb you are. <laughs> and yeah. if you were like, hey, like if you just said... Uh, I'm considering doing some uh, conventional deadlifts today, but it hurts my back. I mean, repeat that sentence to yourself again. And then maybe rethink the way that you do it. Like, yeah. why not just, uh, as we did with the f um, 
the heavy weighted carries, we uh, raised the weighted carries up a little bit by putting some plates underneath it. So yes. if you're listening to this podcast, and especially if you're a younger guy, I know you're thinking, man, these guys are fucking old. <laughs> and and these guys are falling apart. And uh, yeah. now, now we're preaching against, you know, you might think, oh, shit, they're preaching against lifting heavy. We're certainly not doing that. We're just trying to relay a message of, of how you can stay fresh and how you can yeah, stay on top of things. Yeah, it's just the opposite message, yeah. as a matter of fact, right. because I was – my hip injury was so bad that I had quit. Mm-hmm. Right. And Mark Philippi brought me back from the dead with the mobility work. And uh, I have a video on YouTube, Stan Effort and yeah. Mobility. With yeah, Mark you did Philippi a lot of great stuff. That goes man. through all of that. And it was after that point that I came back and squatted 900 with Mark and, and set the 2,300 pound world <laughs> right. record. That was after I had uh, a hip issue that you thought you had you night. thought you needed surgery I, yeah, you, two <laughs> surgeons told me with mris that, that mm-hmm. you need hip replacement that surgery. was my birthday message to you yes, by the way yeah. thank you i appreciate that yeah and so it's just the opposite message we want them to do better for longer by employing the lessons mm-hmm. that we've learned uh, by keeping themselves healthy on the front end so they don't have to go through this and that includes those mobility exercises the, the kind of stuff that that you said a really crucial training really crucial thing with the, with the pain with being pain free you're saying pain free range of motions like just think about those words again yeah. and think about the movement that you selected uh, in the leg press you're getting a range of motion that otherwise you would not be able to get without pain and you got to just I mean you don't want to get all scientific about it but what is the association your body has with squats when your knees are in a lot of pain it's a really negative association mm-hmm. your yeah. body's like fuck i gotta squat you're thinking in your it causes a lot of chain reaction in your body and i i don't even know what the research would say but i would imagine that cortisol would raise like a lot of things would raise because you're like shit i gotta squat i i want to try to lift something heavy but i know my knees hurt so there's a lot of anxiety associated with all that but when you go to do a leg press you fucking took all that away yeah you took all that weight off your shoulders literally and now you're doing a movement that you can move through a, a pain-free range of motion. On top of it being a pain-free range of motion, there's actually a good range of motion that mm-hmm. you're dealing with, yeah. as opposed to if you squatted, maybe you gotta do partials because you're in so much pain. You know, just do great at what your body lets you do great at at the time, you know, and, yeah. and you will grow on it. When I graduated from college, I got a job as a maintenance man in an apartment complex, and I was sweeping garbage areas and plunging toilets. And that can be, you, you know, pretty depressing after a college degree for $8 an hour. And I said to myself, I'm going to be the best damn garbage area sweeper and toilet plunger on the planet. I'm going to win the world record for, for this. And just with that mindset, you know, I eventually was running that property, developing a $15 million, 200 unit property, and eventually ran uh, one of the largest $100 million assets for a multi-billion dollar REIT. So that's the kind of thing I think that, like you just said, mm-hmm. yeah, this is a crappy exercise having to do banded <laughs> leg presses. Right. But what are you going to invest on in that such that the outcome is greater? Right. And I think that's what's important about this whole process and what you watch uh, very emotionally, very raw, uh, as you read Brian's story of going through his process and ultimately making his right. comeback. He got better. He went through this whole thing that we're talking about mm-hmm. and got better, got back on the platform and, and killed it. And yesterday when we were training, you know, we we, um, we kind of went from one exercise to the next. We didn't do a ton of stuff, but, uh, you know, Stan's the kind of person, you know, we, we did the weighted carries and uh, had the uh, trap bar loaded up with four plates. And uh, I'm talking shit in, into the camera because uh, that's what I always do. I grabbed his belt and was holding it up over my head and we we're just messing around basically and he was like oh i got this don't worry and he's behind me breaking down the plates you know <laughs> and and yeah like uh you know i i own the gym stands a guest and uh we have people i have employees here that can clean the gym up all day long right. and i have people that that's kind of their job and uh but stan doesn't work that way you don't operate that way you're you're kind of uh uh, almost a throwback in a way where you're like, oh, I'm a, I'm I a use collar guy. I'm not I use pariah. these. Yeah, I use these. <laughs> I use these weights. I need to fucking put them back. Yeah. And so there he was pulling the weights off. I That's kind of story yesterday. But when I was running my telephone company, I had 100 employees, 25 million dollars a year in business. And at night when everybody would leave, I'd go down. And I'd refill the filtered water bottles, those big jugs. <laughs> with tap water so i wouldn't have to buy <laughs> that's how cheap i am I'm you're gonna just, get a bill for uh the yeah. cancer that all these people yeah, well, have from the fucking i knew it i knew it that cheap bastard 
but that's that's the blue collar in me and that's the way i looked at my whole career in bodybuilding that's why i've always said i do more in powerlifting that's why i do more outside the gym than inside the gym that's what allows me to enjoy that time in the gym right that was never work for me training mm. that was always the best part of the weekend every meal have you just and, always been wired this way i you know, I, probably it's probably that type A personality. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I just I just saw the benefit of uh, focusing on all the things that made that training session better. And that's why I come in here every single time with my broken record, and I harp on sleep, and I harp on meals. And I what about on, what about things that you rehab? What about things that you aren't good at? Do you just not like? Do you just not try them? You know, like like you're successful in business, you you were successful in powerlifting, bodybuilding. Do you sometimes maybe look at a business opportunity? Um, let's say, let's just hypothetically say it's real estate, and say that's not a strength of yours. Do you just not look into it, or do you try? You're like, screw it, I'm going to do the best I possibly can in this. Well, at some space. point, you become the the conductor at some point you recruit the talent that is good at those things mm -hmm. we talked about that yesterday with right. respect to the, the specific marketing and the social media and right internet marketing but when i ran my telephone company i hired an attorney i right. hired a uh, an it this guy. is not my area of expertise yes, i hired an account it along to somebody else you can't be all things you have to be you know focus on you know i tried to stay in right. my lane and focus on where my talents are and then recruit people who have those talents and right. the same thing with respect to my training i tried to find people who were value adds that could help uh, motivate me or coach me to become Such better with myself Flex or with you or uh you know whoever it may be along the way so i think it's important that you have to understand that you're not alone in this deal nor was brian carroll when he went to to dr stuart mcgill here's mm -hmm. one of the best powerlifters in the world reached out to someone for help and listened and and that was a very difficult yeah. whole process and so you if you need to get help you know, reach out. I'm just saying, buy these books if you have a similar circumstance, or try my program for my, uh, what rehab my knees, what rehab my hips, and now my back. It's uh, you know, as we talked through this thing, and I and I did what was recommended from the books. I read them cover to cover and, and highlighted them and bent pages. And uh, it's, I, it's why I can't do eBooks because I can't figure out how to refer back to them, even though they do have a uh, you know, Kindle has the little yeah. highlighter, thing. right? But I, I can never go back and scroll through every page. You know, I want to be able to <laughs> and find them. But I did. I, I found I all the things that mattered most. I think we need a book from Stan the Rhino Efforting is what we need. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually a really good idea. It, you know, it seems like so you many acquired people. acquired so much knowledge over the years. I have. And I've required, acquired a lot of it from other people, applied it, and it's worked. Uh, and I'm quick to give credit where credit's due. And uh, now, so now if somebody asks me, I refer them to that individual. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie Cohn says, or read this book, or, right, you yeah. know, and anytime I do a program for someone, if I say something about sleep, or I say something about sodium, or I say something about carbs, et cetera, I attach an article, one of my favorites that I've uh, earmarked over the years, for them to read. Now, of course, they ask me a question that's in the article, then I know they didn't read it, but that's right. my job. They're paying me, I suppose. But right. I want them to understand that I'm not freestyling over here, and I didn't invent this stuff. You know, there's some very smart people who, yeah. who, ha who have, after many, many years, if not decades of experience with PhDs, who found, came to the same conclusion, and I applied it, and, and it worked. And so now I will endorse those, you know, those methods. Yeah, you've done that a bunch with me, uh, you know, when um, we go back and forth about blood work and some of these other things, you're like, oh, here's an article to check out on uh, this particular thing. It, it uh, One of the ones you sent me uh, was about orange juice and drinking orange juice to yeah. uh, trigger your thyroid and um, stimulate and, the liver. Yeah, Dr. Ray Pete's research, yeah. and he's a Ph.D. with 30 years of experience in biology and physiology. <laughs> right. So there's some really smart people out there, and of course they don't all agree, so you got to – you end up kind yeah. of picking your your favorites, right? As we all do, but uh, the information's there. I'm, I'm, what you've done in the last number of years is is tried to bring that, you know, become a forum for that, right? Interviewing people who uh, to provide people good information because we've had to wade through a lot of crap over the years, yeah. or not ha even had the availability yeah. prior to the internet when I was training. And now there's just so much that. <laughs> You can get distracted. You got to kind of key in on who were who were the the smart folks. Who were right. the, Mark Bell with the talent that he brings on here, the Chris Duffins, the the uh, Greg Knuckles of the world, and the uh, Schoenfelds, and the, you know the Chris Cressers, right. people out there that, that put put out really solid information and are, are well researched. Uh, the book Gary Taubes, probably yeah. one of the best. Uh, you know, good calories, bad calories, probably one of the best scientific research journalists yeah. on the planet right now. 
Uh, and whether or not you agree with everything he says, it's very well documented and supported with articles and uh, studies. And so uh, there's a ton of stuff out there. I take a lot of time every day. I probably read four hours a day or better. Mm. Wow. And I know that people are busier than me, probably, <laughs> and they can't do that. And so I try and give them the, you know, the Reader's Digest version, <laughs> right. uh, which was our discussion today with Dr. McGill's book. It took me, you know, a few days to read. It's, it's, uh, right. he, he, he dummied it down so that I could understand it, but it's still a pretty thick read to, to really want to absorb all that information. Uh, the Gift of Injury is a very easy read. Brian Carroll made right. that very comfortable. I just breezed through it, and I almost immediately, within a day, I could start applying the, the techniques, and I did, and I realized uh, significant success to the point where, again, I couldn't walk yeah. The, the next morning yeah and i was practically crying over the pain and then yesterday i came in and I, I knocked out 600 for two reps yeah that was and, great. you know my back was tight this morning but it's not injured you know yeah. i probably shouldn't have but i did uh, right. brian carroll gave an example of how after he had rehabbed his back he went back to competition he squatted he benched his back didn't feel right he didn't deadlift he pulled out of the competition and he would have won mm. he's just not right and he saved it for another day right and that's that's you know another good good thing to know is right. that, that you know you can live to fight another day well as ed Cohn said there you only have so many yeah <laughs> over the course of a career you yeah. only have so many and it's like yeah. where are you going to spend them and that's the way i felt at the end of my career and i was obviously you know i was pretty old 45 to be putting up 2300 pounds but uh i felt as though it's time you know yeah. i just i don't you're right there's only a finite amount of of those big lifts in you and uh uh, eventually you're going to have to you're going to pay the price if you if you don't kind of curb that appetite well how did you deal with the initial pain with your back uh you know i'm not a fan of painkillers I'm, yeah. I'm not about the most i would do is uh I, fortunately for me this last month i was experimenting with uh, baby aspirin 81 milligrams of aspirin mm -hmm. the sacrilic acid supposed to have some benefit for estrogen suppression um and uh uh I wanted to, to see how that affected my blood work because, you know, I do blood tests every month based on these little experiments that I've done. Um, and that was one I wanted to do. And so uh, that's about all I did. I just kind of relied on the aspirin. I, uh, obviously, you just rest. You know, you, I immediately tried to employ some of those techniques of, of uh, finding pain-free movements and still moving. Interestingly enough, I didn't mention this yet, but in the book, and like we've talked about these 10-minute walks, mm -hmm. as I'm reading through, uh, uh, the gift of injury, Dr. Stuart McGill recommended as part of the therapy to take three 15 minute walks a day. Yeah. And in, in Brian Carroll's case, uh, with a pretty aggressive arm swing <clears throat> for anterior core stabilization. Oh, right. really? Uh, and he employed that and has been using it ever since as part of his therapy. I, I think those, the yeah. 10, I can't say enough about 10 minute walk. I think well, it's and also, uh, you know, moving your arms around is going to get your heart rate elevated. Even sure. Faster. Mm. Sure. You know, so like I sometimes, uh, you know, when in when as it gets colder, when I go for a walk, I try to get more movement and move around faster, so I'm not like freezing my ass off the yeah. whole time. Yeah. But that'll increase your uh, increase your heart rate a little bit. What I find interesting about um, health, you know, training for health or dieting for health, is uh, it's not you know, prevention is never sexy. You know, hey, like yeah. if you do this, because I guess. You still can't really insure anything. You still um, no. Still might fucking die of a heart attack. You still might yeah. end up dying the same death, and maybe even <clears throat> ten years sooner than some asshole who's drinking and smoking and pissing their life away. <laughs> right. You know, there, there's not, and so that is uh, prevention is not always a great uh, sell. Hey, if you do these things. Uh, you'll be less likely to hurt your back. And it's, right, not, it's, right. not, uh, it's not a guarantee. Uh, but what is cool is that by improving your health, you can, still, you can improve your strength a lot. And you can come back stronger. Uh, and you've done that with Hap Thor Bjornsson, who's the mountain, uh, world's strongest man competitor. I think he finished second this year. I yep. think that's his highest placing ever, right, in the yep. World's Strongest Man yep. competition. Um, he's had excellent showings pretty much since the time you've been uh, working with him. And then recently, he fucking squatted 970 pounds. <laughs> with a six-pack. I saw yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. He's, dude, he's, he's huge. He's 400 he's jacked. pounds. I mean, that's the tallest guy ever yeah. to squat probably even over 800 pounds, much less 900 probably pounds. Yeah. Um, it's, it's unbelievable. So 
some, again, some people I think that listen to this message and sometimes when I communicate with younger people and I tell them 10 minute walk, they're probably just like, oh, that's because he's like older and he's been lifting for a long time. <laughs> yeah. But these 10 minute walks can be really valuable and they can help you be jacked and they can help you be strong. Is yes. that right? Yeah. I use them with people who are on calorie deficit to diet and I use them with people on calorie surplus to get bigger. And Hawthorne is a perfect example. There's somebody who uh, most of what I did with Hawthorne was outside the gym, not inside the gym. The same, uh, you know, I went again all through his, his blood work, and yeah. his deficiencies, <clears throat> his sleep, uh, his, uh, uh, his travel uh, and preparedness. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of uh, it wasn't just consistency and discipline, but time management. It was right. all the intangible things. And we, you know, I think you urged him like bring his own food with him, right? Yeah, because absolutely. sometimes you're traveling to different countries. That's, you don't know what you're getting. It seems so common sense, but you're surprised how yeah. people let those things, they deprioritize them as compared to training. And again, the more choices you have uh, and the more anxiety can build up over, hey, hey where are we going to go eat? Yeah. Yeah. And he's thinking, I, Stan yeah. told me rice <laughs> and steak and. I don't, I don't know where to go for that. And yeah. Then you go to well, fortunately, in his case, I involved his manager, his girlfriend, and his trainer or his, right. his uh, training partner. Mm -hmm. uh, because Takes yeah, all the stress it, away. A lot of those details are you know pain, pain in, in the, the ass for him to think. I'd like for him just to focus. When I came and trained with you, and I went trained with Flex, I wanted to turn my brain off, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to have to worry about all that stuff. We collaborated, we sat down, we talked about the plan, and then I from there I just turned my brain on to lifting weights. And yeah. So I didn't worry about all the details after that. So, you know, and you're right. You mentioned just very briefly that um, uh, all these things that help you get better in training. The problem is, is sometimes we try and introduce too much, too right. long of a warm up, too large of a variety of, of yeah. ancillary exercises or et cetera. Now, when I was rehabbing, I would spend an hour two or three times a week right. focused just on those exercises or I would do something every so you can day come back faster it's, you know to come back but while training um you you can drastically reduce that hmm. uh just like our warm-up yesterday was lasted all of what five minutes yeah, it was, there yeah. our core stabilization really exercises <clears throat> and the same is true when i work with uh you know like a, a professional mma fighter or an nba basketball guy uh, what i do in the off season with them is very different than the on season uh, when they're um, preparing for a fight Mm. they might only come in and do strength training once a week for less than 30 minutes. And it'll wow. just be a, you know, some triples on the dips, some triples on the chins, weighted stuff, and then some weighted carries, and they're they out. can't afford to spend that much time no. in there. There's only so be, much physical to capital detriment. to spend, and you have to make sure you're not spending it in the wrong place. And then the off-season will incorporate more uh, frequency and volume. Mm -hmm. But uh, So there's, a, there's an, a benefit to that. When I was, uh, I did a seminar recently in the UK with Eddie Cohn and um, Charles uh, Poliquin. Poliquin. And they introduced some exercises, and, and people, uh, they were great exercises, you know, the, the one arm uh, lift of the barbell uh, and, and hold and some uh, extension work. Oh, yeah, the grip thing that uh, Eddie does, yeah. Yeah, and uh, a, a few other great exercises. And I, I told the group, I said, look, if you don't have the time and energy to do a lot of these, then consistency is more important than intensity uh, or anything else. And so just do one set. All right. And then what you'll find is, is that over time, because you've done that one set consistently, all of a sudden you're getting stronger. It's getting easier. Right. You're, you're getting the same improvements you want as though you'd invested a, a, you know, a significant effort into it. Right. It's just consistency. Throw it in your routine and do it. Yeah. You, you, if you give somebody too many things to do, they'll probably do nothing. Yeah. I should get back. You asked me and you said, you know, what did you do after you were in pain? Well, yeah. the, the first thing I did is I reached out to a physical therapist that I know and uh, ran in. And, uh, you know, this is often the case. Some people, they, they, you have to take control of your own uh, uh, recovery mm -hmm. and your own training and your own diet. At some point, you're ultimately responsible. And yes, we reach out to folks for information, but you need to filter through that, make a plan and stick to it. Uh, and ultimately you have to know best, you know, you right. have to be confident that, that the information that you're getting is going to work for you. And I know a lot about this stuff. I've been around a long time. I went to a physical therapist and, uh, you know, we did the assessment and it was pretty obviously it was a L5, um, uh, herniated herniation. But then the rehab started to look very unfamiliar to me, uh, for what I'm comfortable with. It included, um, Electric stem was the first thing, but I get it. You know, the PT has eight 
people in there with assistance uh, and putting them on, putting them 10 minutes on electric stem, uh, you know, that starts the billing process. Perhaps yeah. provides more value. <laughs> sure. But yeah. it, it's not much value. I'm sorry. It's just not. And if you're an electric stem guy, that's cool. Do your thing. But in my experience and the research suggests it's not much value. Uh, same with those uh, little, um, what are they? The sound wave right. machines. Uh, they feel good. It's ultrasound. Just, yeah, yeah, ultrasound. Say, hey, that feels great, you know. Or the massage work, you know. Right. That feels good too. And, and that there may be some benefit to the scar tissue work, et cetera. But it's not, it's not what Stuart McGill is prescribing. And those, those methods aren't in his suggested uh, priorities. Um, and then the next thing you know, we're doing some stretching exercises. <laughs> and the next thing you know, we're laying down and we're doing the lumbar push against the floor. Mm. All Pelvic of the tilt, things yeah. that in Dr. McGill's <laughs> book, he's like, nah. And it didn't feel right at the time. And I, I knew better. But I'm like, this guy's the professional. And I like those people. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that... that uh, you're not always going to get good information from, you know, right. your, your therapist that they aren't as experienced and knowledge as experienced and knowledgeable as Dr. McGill. And, and it's just a fact. There's some people that know how to do this better than others have more experience. Yeah. And some of these things have not changed in a long time. I can tell you because I, I injured my back at 19 Yeah, and uh, it was a problem off and on for a long time. And I, Every time I went to a physical therapist, it was all those things. You might have seen like an inversion table yeah. thrown in at some point or, um, you know, a little bit more strengthening exercises or whatever. And it feels good temporarily. It feels good temporarily, but man. It's it, worse later. It is worse later. And it seems yeah. like uh, like you're kind of kept on the string, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I don't think that's their intention. These are well-meaning uh, people. They learned what they learned at school. They, they want to help you, but I just don't think they know what but, Stuart yeah, does. And, and actually, since I started powerlifting, I have not had a back problem at all. And Bingo. a lot of it was obviously strength. Strength, core strength in yeah. particular. And that's what he tries to to you know emphasize in the book that that's the goal i did i've done that again with nba players i put them on that that weighted carry mm -hmm. uh maybe they're injured and, and got dropped from the team because of lower back pain <clears throat> and uh, uh that seems to be one of the that and adding muscle back to them because mm -hmm. they tend to be kind of wasted from over over running and, and right they usually i think we talked about it before when i worked with a professional soccer player the mm -hmm. same thing when he i asked him when were you your best and he says you know when he was in europe playing professional soccer and he weighed 200 I said, what do you weigh now he says 185 so they ran the hell out of him they wasted a lot of muscle off of his body he got weak his back got hurt so my told him my goal was to get him back to 200 you know and to do more intermittent stuff rather than every single day all of the extensive cardio stuff and the and i got him off of stretching yeah <laughs> yeah you know, that seems to be what everybody wants to do oh i stretched it <laughs> it may feel you know <laughs> yeah. all right when you're doing it but you're picking the scab and so right. that's, you know, that's just all the information I have. It's what's worked for me. It's from, I think, one of the best resources in the world. And I, I just want people to, to be able to share in that and possibly, you know, make, get, find a pathway to pain-free uh, training again. And, and back pain seems to be one of the most prominent problems. Yeah. And what I like with a weighted carry is that uh, it's immediately scalable, you know, so you can do it with other people, especially if you're doing it with uh, something like dumbbells. Somebody can grab the 40s and you can grab the 80s. And if somebody really has a lower back problem, they can grab the 20s and walk really far. Yeah. You know, now you're just implementing like a long walk with, with uh, whatever weights you have in your hands. And it's, it's easy. It's an easy exercise to do. Anyone who's got yep. the ability to walk can handle a little bit more weight in their hands. And there's the, the progressions there's, are available. Again, I yeah. can't do anything without a progression. And you can right. either increase weight or increase reps or increase distance or decrease rest time. There's so many different yeah. ways to come in and set PR. You can get a, a weighted vest and walk with that. Yeah. Yeah. You can uh, do an overhead press while you're walking, which yep. creates a whole other challenge. Now you're really trying to uh, honker down on your core when you're doing stuff like that. Uh, we've done stuff in here where you, you're holding a, uh, like a kettlebell over your head as you're walking. And that's like you don't need much weight for that. Yeah. <laughs> no. And it's still still going to burn a lot of calories <clears throat> and still be fast. and still be really effective. That's great. You mentioned uh, yesterday, which I think this is awesome, <laughs> that you that you hate motivation. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to talk about that a little bit because um, I think that's 
I think that some people are just built a certain way where they don't really need the pep talk and then other people kind of feel that they need a pep talk. And, uh, there's a lot of people, uh, trying to motivate people and get people excited about training and get people excited about this or that. What's kind of your main, uh, your main pet peeve about motivation or motivational speech or any of that kind of stuff? Yeah. Let me put it into context. I understand the necessity of it. Hmm. And I said in my rant on obesity that the best trainers are the ones that can motivate, uh, and right. encourage people for the long term. Right. Because that's the number one problem. We've talked about it many times before is consistency. Staying on the program. You know, all diets work when strictly adhered to until you fall off. You know, same <laughs> mm -hmm. with the training programs. What's the best diet? You know, the one you'll follow. What's the best exercise? The one you'll do. For the long term, everybody looks at things in terms of these 30, 60, 90 day challenges. Those don't mean anything to me. What happens at a year, two right. years? You know, is it sustainable? Were you able to, to stick with the program? And I understand that there's north of a 70% failure rate uh, with weight loss at right. one year. There's a lot of success stories at 30 days, <laughs> you know? Uh, so I understand the necessity and the importance of it. I just hate it because it's the people that are, you know, rah, 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 motivating, mm -hmm. motivating in many times, in, in many cases, uh, I want the individual to make the commitment. The flies here the are the flies back. That's the same one yesterday. Yeah, they're uh, they're kamikazes. Yeah, I, I you know I hate it because it 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 creates the uh, I think for me the feeling that the individual that's trying to accomplish something maybe isn't doing something they want to do because if you're if you're self inspired you're self motivated if it's something that if it's if you're something that you really want to do right uh, it becomes easier and that's why i promote the concept of of trying to find a diet program that works for the individual right rather than telling them to eat this diet you know whether it's the the keto diet or uh, the paleo diet or whether it's uh, intermittent fasting it doesn't matter to me what works for them right you know what do they like to eat when do they like to eat you know where do they like to eat uh, I had a, I mentioned that my training partner or my business partner came down and he was, I think, north of 280 pounds and none of his family, the men in his family ever lived, uh, to 60 years old. Wow. And, uh, he's African American. He was high blood sugar and, uh, obese. And, and so he came down and now he travels all the time. He's never home. He's eating in airports and restaurants right. and staying at hotels. So I couldn't really give him a, a diet program you know, a traditional diet program. Right. Hey, do the keto, do the, so I had to take him around to restaurants that he would typically be at, uh, and show him an exercise program that he could utilize in the absence of a gym, uh, or in the absence of a kitchen right. and, and do those things. And so we tried to find something that worked for him. And a lot of times the, the motivational stuff tends to be, uh, centered around something they can sell you, mm -hmm. uh, which is a particular program. And, for me, that's not necessarily the way to go. That's your, that's your program. That's not their program. That's your lifestyle. That's not right. their lifestyle. Right. You know, that's, that's your goal. That might not be their goal. It could be short term, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think inspiration, it, it might be a little bit different because, uh, you may run into somebody, rub elbows with somebody, or even just see somebody uh, via social media that inspires you to uh, head down a certain path, and that might started. be, yeah. and that might be a little different than just some motivational words that uh, you forget three days from now. Or, yeah. um, you know, you could be as motivational as you want on your way to the gym. You can have your pre-workout. You can listen to some great speech, <clears throat> and then you go to do a movement, and there's pain. How motivated are you now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm also you know, a big believer that it's 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. Again, the blue collar guy. And I, I noticed that everybody has dreams. You go to bed at night and you wake up in the morning with this great idea. But execution is what matters most. You know, and you can come up with the, the greatest you know, dream or goal in the world. But if, if you don't actually have a plan and pursue it with some you know, deliberate intent and consistency, it's never going to come to fruition. And that's the hard part. I know, we want to, go ahead. I know we want to talk about, about business too. Right. Should we take a little safety break here yeah. mm -hmm. and then we'll pick it right back up? Sure. I believe so. All righty. Okay. That wraps up episode one. 
on to episode two next week and Friday's episode, which is just me and Mark. Uh, shout out to all of our sponsors, 8Ban Apparel at 8BandStrong.com, Bodybuilding.com for all of your supplement needs, Complex USA for cutting edge muscle stem machines, get an additional 28% off when you use the code POWERCAST on all but the lowest price model. Reebok.com, home of the Legacy Lifter, the official shoe of the PowerCast. Increase your bench at howmuchabench.net. Get 15% off slingshots with the code POWERCAST. Power, the only strength magazine available in both digital and print at thepowermagazine.com and Precision Nutrition. Get the free course, especially for our listeners, at get.pn slash powercast. That's G-E-T dot P-N slash powercast. You can find Stan at Stan Efforting on all the social media. Mark is Mark Smelly Bell, at Mark Smelly Bell everywhere. I am at the Jim McD on all the social medias. Follow the show on Instagram. We are at Mark Bell's Powercast. <laughs>